to, how come the Mennonite women can just stay home and it seems like absolutely no struggle to just be on one income? Do you know what I don't think I've ever heard of a Mennonite spending money on? We are not oppressed. I think it's such a privilege. Who does the budget and pays the bills in each household? You know, I'm very ashamed. Does your husband let you buy a thing? A thing. I don't know what <laughs> I buy whatever I want. You know, well this one's cheaper. It's this much cheaper and it's really the same thing. So we're gonna get this brand. Oh, but that doesn't work on everything. No, not cheez -Its everything. must be name brand cheez -Its. Yeah. But we are going to write that off. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> I've been mean, Mennonites here. Hello. Yeah. Is keeping up with the Joneses, is that whole syndrome as strong in the Mennonites as it is in like the mainstream culture? And sadly, I think it is. Yes. Just I in think different it is. ways. Yeah. And he had to give 90% of his income to his... So I don't think money matters that much to Jesus, but he knew how much it would matter to us and how much we would think about it. Oh, I like that. I don't know what you did, but I like it better. What's well, up, looking down on us. Yeah. So I'm going to scooch in a little bit, get all cozy. Yeah, I like that better. <laughs> Oh my, we're both wearing pencil skirts and we're like, we don't feel like having to sit correctly and cross our legs. <laughs> so we're just going to sit and yeah, we're good. We won't flash at <laughs> Anyway, welcome back to Honey and Homemaker, season two, episode two. Today we're talking about Mennonites and money, money. per your guys' enthusiastic request. Yeah. And we're going to almost run this as more of a Q&A after our introduction here. You guys had so many good questions and things that I didn't even think to ask because I was just born into this Mennonite culture, but I right. see we have a very different viewpoint on money and applications of how we, um, yeah, treat money, use money, think about money, and maybe in some ways you'll be shocked how similar it is too, you know, to yeah. the mainstream world. So yeah, I did want to say, we normally try to say we're only speaking from our own opinions and our own perspectives, but in this episode, we're going to be talking a lot from our observations of our community, the people around us, acquaintances. In general, it, typically. But, yeah, stuff like that. And we're talking about Mennonite community. We're more of like mid-range conservative. Yeah. I'm not sure what to say. Yeah, exactly. So, But we also have experience with more conservative. So we're not ultra conservative, but we came from more, you could say, ultra conservative backgrounds. Our parents were raised more conservative. So we would trend towards more conservative in our experiences. We'll talk about some of our own personal money struggles, habits, um, experiences. We, I think, have both felt poor and wealthy mm -hmm. at different points of our lives. Yeah. I think we can all acknowledge that we are um, very blessed. Yes, no how absolutely. So yeah. anyway, before we get into it, Gina, recipes. Woohoo! Favorite part, right? <laughs> yeah, I like sharing a good recipe. Although mine, per usual, is more of a method, <laughs> not necessarily a recipe, um, but mac and cheese. I am a huge fan of mac and cheese. I like a baked mac and cheese that like sticks together with lots of different kinds of cheeses. My husband likes like a soupy um, processed cheese, mac and cheese, so we do both at our household. But my favorite mac and cheese is the way my mom used to make it. Um, you get a 9 by 13 or casserole dish appropriate for your family size, melt a couple tablespoons of butter in there, dump your dry uncooked macaroni, coat it with the melted butter, and then you pile on cheese. I like Gouda, Swiss cheese, pepper jack, any kind of cheese, American, Velveeta, if you want to go that route, cheddar, but like a mixture of cheese. Clean out the cheese drawer, whatever uh, cheese yeah. you got left, throw it in there. I don't know how much, you just want a lot, enough cheese. And then sprinkle with salt and pepper, and then pour milk and or water. My mom used to do milk and then add some water. I usually just do all milk. I'm sitting here cringing because I do milk and heavy whipping cream. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I add some half and half. But you want to get the liquid to cover the cheese and pasta. So you want it completely covered. And then you just bake it until it's done. <laughs> I don't know what temperature. I don't know for how long. 350. Or you can do it slower. You can do it at like 250 for multiple hours. But... 350 for an hour, an hour and a half is gonna, I think, get you where you want it. But yes, when it's all cooked, then it's done. Oh, I'm so hungry. It's <laughs> so good. <laughs> it, it, that's my favorite way to make it. And then, cheese. of course, douse it with a healthy dose of ketchup across the top. Gross! Are you serious? <laughs> I actually hate ketchup, but that's the one way I'll eat it on mac and cheese. It's so much better. Okay, then. I like to add a dash of mustard, too, but. Yes, yes. I do that when I make a cheese sauce yeah. to pour over top. I often don't do it in that version. 
But yes, mustard is always good in mac and cheese. Yeah, okay, well, sticking with carbs, I might as well get a share a carby recipe. This is another breakfast recipe, if you watched last um, week's episode. But we actually, I made this for supper because it's very time intensive. Well, not really time intensive. You'll see. Basically, it's buttermilk biscuits, and I started making this recipe when I was very young married, and the key is to freeze your butter, or at least have it refrigerated, and to grate it into small little pieces. And the method feels like, oh, there's so much to it. You know, homemade buttermilk biscuits, why not just buy the pop-open ones? And we are not above that at all. We do that too. But homemade biscuits, after you like kind of put the dough together, it's like kind of shaggy with the frozen butter, you put it, or the very cold butter, you put it back in the freezer for a little bit to get everything cold again, the milk's in there. Um, they're so, buttermilk again. And I did share a hack for buttermilk in the last episode, but you can make your own buttermilk with vinegar and milk, or you can buy, apparently, buttermilk packets. So, like the dried stuff. It's so packets, it's like in a canister. But oh, okay, Yeah, I haven't bought it, as you can tell. Anyway, the way we love to eat these is to, um, you are supposed to use a biscuit cutter and cut them out in circles, but then you have waste. So I just cut them in squares. So maybe they're not as aesthetic looking, whatever, but I bake those and while they're baking, I make dry beef gravy or sausage mm -hmm. gravy and we eat that for supper once in a while and it is so good. Um, usually the biscuits run out, sorry, usually the dry beef gravy runs out before the biscuits do. So then sometimes we'll just substitute with I'll make another batch of something, you know, sausage gravy. Sounds amazing. Yeah. My kids are not huge fans of dry beef gravy, but we buy our beef in bulk. And I always make sure to get lots of dry beef because I just it. love it so much. And it costs like an arm and a leg yes, at the grocery store. terribly expensive. Yeah. If you come to Lancaster County and are eating out at a Mennonite breakfast place or whatever, order the dry beef gravy. Yes. <sighs> anyway, so I'll put my recipe for dry beef gravy and the buttermilk biscuits down below because it kind of turned into an ad for both. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we'll get into... Mennonites and money. Yes. As you know, we like to make these super practical and not so much like, you know, a Sunday school lesson or anything, but I did want to dive into just one verse quickly to keep in mind as we're talking about this topic. Jesus, did you know, he talked about money more than anything, any other topic in the Bible. 11 of his 31 parables were about money. So I don't think money matters that much to Jesus, but he knew how much it would matter to us Very and how much we would think about it. And he knew that it was going to be a stumbling block and a divisive issue and it's just very practical. And so I feel like he knew that it was necessary to talk about money as much as he did. Yeah, money has the potential to do so much good, um, but it can also really distract us from things that really matter. Um, Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. So it's just speaking there to the never-ending, unsatiating appetite mm -hmm. for more. Yep. For more. So, do you guys, are you familiar with the stereotype of Mennonites being stingy? I don't know if you are or not, and I, myself, I don't know if it's a Mennonite trait. I think it's just, like, a personal trait in myself. I feel like I have to fight, because my husband doesn't have that at all, and he's very much a Mennonite as well. So, I don't necessarily think you can pinpoint that to Mennonites, but we are more old-school mindset, like, as a whole, yeah. right? Well, aren't Mennonites also, like, notoriously bad tippers? Oh, dear. For example. I hope not. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I think that's embarrassing. Yeah, it is. So and we mortified. always try to, you know, prove them wrong when it comes to that. But I think no kidding. Yeah, maybe that's changed over. That's time. a terrible stereotype. It to is. Have. It is. Not or generosity. like you, you ever hear of like the Mennonite who will leave a tract instead, instead of, of tips. Inst like, oh my goodness, that is just not okay. <laughs> I'm, uh, that's mortifying. Yeah, I think too we're a little more old school in a lot of ways. We're more traditional, and maybe that scarcity mindset of like the Great Depression long ago and stuff. Maybe it has hung on a little bit longer of like, we got to try to be more frugal. We got to not, you know, think about where our money's going, be conscious of it. Many Mennonites are hard laborers and working hard for their money, like with actual sweat and stuff. So maybe yeah. that kind of infiltrated into it a little bit. Yeah. Frugality is great. I want to learn to have that to some kind of a modicum, you know, of decency. Yeah. I think we're taught as Mennonites that money is valuable and we're taught the value of money sometimes to the extreme to our detriment where we value it even more than we should. Yeah, but I, I hope that's not a Mennonite thing, and if it is, we are gonna break it one by one yeah. with our children, our yeah. children and stuff, right? Um, I think I even learned that from my husband. I just came from, I saw this in one of my off, um, patriarchs on the one side, that, you know, more of like a stingy, like, 
got to hold on to it. If you don't look out for yourself, who's going to look out for you type of thing. I saw that in myself so much. You know, we drive to the beach and I would like try to figure out the gas money and stuff. And Josh has taught me so much to just let somebody borrow your vehicle if they need it. Or, you know, it's going to come back at some point. You know, we don't believe in karma, but in the same way, good deeds do come back to you. They find yeah. a way of, you know, if you help someone out, there'll be a time where you're going to need help too. Or even and, if they don't, like, you know, Jesus said, if someone asks you for your coat, you give them your Sure, yeah. too, or whatever. Wouldn't you like, rather hold your head high with the short end of the stick in your hand than have the yeah. long end of the stick and feel sheepish? <laughs> That's a huge reply. Ooh, my. We live in the farmland here. Anyway, which, if you ask me, I think farmers are about the richest people out there. They make their own schedule, they work for themselves, and they have all that land, and... I don't know. That's... Buy dirt. <laughs> there you go. So, why don't we go quickly down through some ways that we feel men being a Mennonite Saves us money or costs us money. That can be fascinating. Saves or costs. Yeah. And then we'll dive into the Q&A because you guys had some really good questions. Juicy questions. Yeah, I was yeah. blown away by the good questions. I think we could have a whole episode on just your questions. But yeah. Maybe, well, maybe, two maybe this would be a little longer one or something. Yeah. yeah. So, how does being a midnight save us money? Yeah, no Botox or plastic yeah. surgery. All that stuff. Yeah. yeah. You know, the expensive hair appointments every month. Nail right? appointments. Nail, yeah, I mean, if that. we get our nails done, it's usually for a special occasion or for a fun girls' night out. It's not something we, like, do on the reg. Yeah. <laughs> it comes from our the principle that we teach our children and it has been taught to us of just, like, the import, the importance or the value of simplicity and, like, focusing on what really matters. Like, our forefathers years and years ago didn't even want to spend money on entertainment because they thought that was a waste of time. So think how far we've come from that. Like, yeah, we well, definitely people, spend money on entertainment. Yeah, some people do hold more to that value than others, like the whole entertainment thing. Um, okay, but yes, no, we would buy tickets to, you know, the local Barnstormers softball right. game or whatever, you know. Or even, like, cable TV. Go to the fair and spend yeah. some money on food. Right. Or, yeah. Well, yeah. cable TV. What well, Mennonites do you talk to? None. I mean, that's one way we save money is by not having cable TV. Yes. I mean, a lot of us do have streaming services here and there. Um, but, yeah, that's one yeah. way we save money by minimizing entertainment. Audiobooks, Libby. Yes, script. <laughs> oh, yeah, script. Yeah, there you go. I should put that link down below again. If anybody yeah. wants to sign up for script, it's yeah. what, audiobooks. It's a great form of entertainment. Yes, we love it. <laughs> we don't, like, have lavish weddings. Most of us don't spend thousands of dollars on our wedding dress. Maybe pe most people do. Conservative. No, you sell your wedding you dress. You sell your own. I, I mean, I did. You did. Yeah. Um, my sister stood in, but... Um, my fabric was like $25 a yard, and my mom was horrified. I think my dress was total $50. Mine was $100, yeah. and I was living large. Yeah, she was. <laughs> Real spending. <spend -to> <laughs> yeah, so like our weddings, actually, we have rolled against certain things, so you even if you wanted to spend money, you couldn't because... Right, you're very limited. You, yeah. You're not having all the fancy. And that, of course, is a spectrum. Like, there's Mennonites who aren't even allowed to wear white for the wedding because it's too mainstream and We should worldly. have a topic of Mennonite weddings. Oh my goodness. Who wants to hear about that? Maybe in the spring. Yeah, let us know. <laughs> There's a lot of juicy deets there. I have my own drama I could share. Yeah. <laughs> There's drama. It could be shared. Anyway, but yes, I'm so glad we don't have that um, expectation. And I got to thinking about it. Is keeping up with the Joneses, is that whole syndrome as strong in the Mennonites as it is in like the mainstream culture? And sadly, I think it is. Yes, just I in think different it ways. Yeah. We like compare ourselves is. among ourselves just Absolutely. like everyone. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I think even like, so we don't, like Mennonite women traditionally are a lot of the time don't make a lot of their own money. We both have hobbies that also make a little bit of money. So that's nice right. too. But I feel like, especially even among my peers and stuff, like we don't just throw around large quantities of money, but then we'll like nickel and dime ourselves to death on clothing and stuff to keep yeah. up with the Joneses and like, you know, you have to have a new dress for this occasion and that occasion and this thing and that thing. And it can add up after a while. And like, I feel like depending in different circles, your clothing can be more of a weight than maybe in some cultures where yeah. you're just like athleisure is like the thing of the world, right? Everybody just dresses in leggings and you know. Yeah. Do you know what I don't think I've ever heard of a Mennonite spending money on? A Disney World, Disneyland vacation? Have you ever, per like, that's insane expensive. Yeah. And well, one, our kids wouldn't, well, okay, maybe now you're like, oh. I was going to say, my kids wouldn't know the characters. My kids don't watch Disney. Yeah. I mean, maybe. Well, the Disney of old, there. I hear, is gone. I don't know. Yeah, I don't want to take my kids there. But yeah, that's that's a very expensive vacation. Now, we go on vacations, and sometimes they are, can be quite costly, but I think Disney vacations are a whole nother level. I never thought of that. Like, I don't feel like I'm depriving my kids. Like, I bet some of you feel like, oh my word, my friends took their kids to Disneyland for a week. Well, don't, don't a lot you know, of families feel like that's something they have to do at some point? Um, there is amusement parks in the area and stuff. Um, 
Hershey Park. And like, yeah, places like that, but it's yeah. not like a Disney World experience for right. sure. Right, completely sure. different, I think. Yeah. yeah, and it's not the norm just to take your family and just go off, you know, on an exotic trip. But I will just say, you know, Mennonites have a lot of missionaries overseas, and we do really try to support them, and we yeah. try to send a family over. We just had a family from our church go to Africa to, you know, check in with a family that's serving over there, and the church all shared in the cost. So it wasn't that family taking their five children overseas on their own dime, you know, you can that's help cool. share in that. Yeah. And it's like part of being a support team. So yeah, um, I guess that could cost, that could cost you money as a Mennonite. Another way that being a Mennonite, I feel, saves us a lot of money. And this is a question I get asked a lot too. How come the Mennonite women can just stay home? And it seems like absolutely no struggle to just be on one income. And it's just like the norm. And honestly, it is the norm. Um, to be like what the mom stays at home and takes care of her children. That's the norm. And I hope it stays that way. I, I really do. So. We are not oppressed. I think it's such a privilege. Yes. Check out our last episode. If you want to hear more on that, <laughs> plug, plug, yeah. but think about this. We are very much more as Mennonites steeped in the trades, the common laborers more, not like the high lawyering jobs and, um, like business execs corporate. and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. The corporate America. So the need for going to an expensive college is really not there as much. It's, unless, of course, you want to get in the medical field, EMTs, nursing. I mean, even a lot of that stuff is trade, like EMT school yeah. and stuff. Um, it's a lot of apprenticing and that kind of thing. Yeah, most of our guys, they start their trade right out of high school. Or even on weekends. And, and then stuff. by the time they're 25, 30, they're either well up in a company or they own their own business by that point. They started their own. So I feel like... By skipping those four years or whatever of college, you're already yeah. so much further ahead. Exactly. So think about that. Going into marriage with a $6,000 wedding under your belt, zero college debt possibly, um, been working since you were 15, which I know some Mennonites don't like this idea, but we both worked our way through high school. Yep. We weren't paying for our high school. Our parents did. Um, but we were working weekends and evenings yep. and stockpiling some money. My husband stopped school at 15, so he was working a full-time job from 16 on, so he wasn't making a bunch of money. But I, he had no expenses, so but yeah, anything yeah. he made anything was he made, profit. Yeah. Except he did pay his parents room and board, which might shock you guys. I don't know. Um, I know that's a different topic altogether. Different yeah. Mennonite families have different ways. Back in the day, back in the day, what our dads were cousins. What did they do? My dad just told me, I just confirmed this with him, he had to give 90% of his income to his parents until he was 20. How young was your dad when he got married? Well, I think they were 20... I shouldn't say. But so he not literally had that. tithe money for himself. I don't know how he did it. And he started a home. I that don't... Is crazy. And they paid their first home off in four years. My dad started in a trailer, and my mom has fond memories of those days, too, yeah. in some ways. So it does not take much to be happy at the start. Money doesn't buy you happiness. Like, I think back to our little... I mean, it can, it can buy your way out of a lot of stress. It is very true. But like, you can be like, you know, just putting away $20 a week or, you know, whatever and yeah. be just as happy yeah. as when you're rolling in the dough and having to try to figure out what to do with it and how to, um, yeah. make it work I mean, for it you and invest it. I mean, some valuable lessons. I don't think, I mean, obviously he didn't do that with us then. We gave 50% of our money until we were out of high school then we paid minimal rent how do you learn to manage your money though if it's that way if you have nothing i don't know so i think there's definitely a balance who paid like, for his gas for his vehicle and stuff i i don't know i i didn't ask him all the nitty gritties of who paid for what but i mean you're hardly buying gas on 10 percent. i don't know how it all worked out but um yeah wow so yeah that kind of maybe answers some of the logistics of that um, but we will say we don't pay for our, high, our college tuition, but we do spread it out over the K through 12 yes. years. If we choose to send our kids to yeah. Christian schools to ching to ching, it's not cheap. Right. Um, and it's actually more than a traditional college tuition. I looked it up, but it's spread out over so many more years. Right. But then the nights have, you know, four, six eight kids. So yeah, it can add up definitely, but it's, it's on your priorities. Yeah. You know, Mennonites have a big emphasis on family. And maybe we should also mention too with the Christian education that there is a foundation where depending what you make, you can actually get like, it's kind of like a scholarship, I guess. You can get money back for your school tuition. Um, yeah. If you qualify. Exactly. Okay. So we get into the Q&A part now? Yeah. Yeah. So grab your water, take a good swig here. We'll put in an insert, insert an ad break and we'll come back with a whole bunch of Q&A questions that you guys ask us. So thanks for that. Follow us on Honey I'm Homemaker if you want to be a part of the Q&A section of some of these videos. Okay, this question is really good. I don't know how much we're going to get into it, but do wealthier Mennonites have more influence in your community? 
If so, how? Brilliant question. I wonder if this person has experience. Coming in hot. Yeah. Oh, dear. Um, the answer is they can. They should not. Yeah. Josh's goal in life is to be filthy rich secretly and to have nobody know yeah. it except, like, just sprinkle money without anybody yeah. There, there are it. some big-name Mennonites who have been known to throw their money around with strings attached, and I think that is completely unacceptable. Yeah, it's definitely frowned upon. Um, but it happens because we're not perfect. <laughs> yeah, and I also think there is a little bit of a, like, we value a simple life, and I think sometimes people look down on wealthy people as, like, they can't be as godly because they're more wealthy because the Bible passage about a wealthy man trying to go through the eye of a needle, right. you know, a camel can do that better than a wealthy man can. Um, but I think that needs to go away because you can have, you can do so much good Yes. with um, your finances if you have your heart in the right place, which that's the key. It's, and it's right hard place. to do. Yeah. But it's hard to not let your cost of the living, camel eye of the needle thing. Did you ever hear that explained? Go ahead. Where the eye of the needle is actually a very tiny city gate. And the camel to get into this gate must take off his like packs, all his like stuff that he's carrying. He has to take all of them off and stoop down, get on his knees, and crawl through the city gate. So when you think of like a literal eye of a needle, it's not wouldn't it be possible. But if this explanation that I heard is accurate, it is possible. But you need to take off all your stuff to wow. get into the kingdom. How powerful. So I don't know if that's accurate. That's how I heard it explained. And it just makes so much sense. Like, yes, it's possible, but you need to let that stuff aside. You need to take those burdens off your back. And you cannot really, take it with you. You can't take it with you. Wow. Wow. Yeah. We can stop right there. That's so good. <laughs> <laughs> what, what other questions do you all have? Um, well, we have a lot of questions about tithing. So I just answered the That's not, one. yeah, that's not... Um, like, I know, like, is it in the Mormon church? Like, you're so, maybe not. I don't even want to throw out stereotypes. But no, nobody monitors our giving. Nobody is like... Some churches do. Check. Not Mennonites. No, no. no Mennonites. Say, but some Arcan. churches do, like, monitor that. And you have to, like, Dish know, out. show your tax return to go there. And Mennonites do not do that. It's no, absolutely not. free will. And if you decide to come to a Mennonite church and you just never tithe, nobody's going to ask you. Nobody's going to check in on you or anything like that. But it is preached over the pulpit that we should give out of a generous heart yeah. and we should um, like help the brother brotherhood super big with Mennonites too. 10% is the traditional thing and then you can also gift over that if you want. Nobody's keeping track. Um, yeah. The Bible says don't know what your left don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Yeah. I've always been taught that um, ten percent is the minimum. Like that's the base amount you should be giving more than that. Yeah, and then some people say it's on gross. Some people say it's on your net. Like, you know. I think that... We don't really just sit around and argue that. No, we don't sit around and argue. It's kind of a secret thing. It's between you and God. And, yeah. But we are going to write that off. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> I've been mean, Mennonites here. Hello. Yeah. Would it be considered taboo if a Mennonite woman made more than her husband? I don't think people would know if that happened. I don't um, know. I'm thinking of one family that the wife, like, started a store. Yeah, so, but still the burden of the money making yeah, falls to I mean, usually I would say that dad. would be pretty rare. Pretty rare, but I mean, what did I hear of the quote? Successful happy people don't bash other successful happy people. So <laughs> anyway. Here's a good one. What methods are you using to teach your children about money and budgeting? Well, for one, you have to let them have some money so they learn how to manage it. So that's something I'm trying to figure out how to have my children earn some money and mine are still pretty young yet, so I would welcome any suggestions yeah. down below. Have you done anything like proactively with your kids? I would say at this point, we're basically just trying to teach them by conversation. Like, you know, when they're at the store, trying to tell them, well, you know, this costs this much money. You know, you can't just buy, like things have a cost and trying to just like live by example more so. Like trying to teach them that daddy works hard for the money and, you know, mommy sews the ropes to make money and you don't just get things for free. So I would say that's at the level we're at now. Now I do give Jack like money to buy like chocolate milk and juice at school and it's at his discretion like, you know, what he buys when. And he's doing pretty good with only doing it like a couple times a week. But I'm not gonna hand him five dollars every week. You know, he has to budget that himself. Oh, okay. Um, so that's one sense. small way. Yeah, almost seven. Okay, that's interesting. My oldest just turned five. Um, but yeah, I do things like, well, this sweater, we can buy you three sweaters for the price of that one. Right. You know, and um, when I'm working at my laptop or something, I will sometimes make a point to tell you, Bonnie, you know, mommy works because going to school is very expensive and it's something that I want to spend my money on, but we, we have to work for it, you know, so she knows that money doesn't just get out of pulled out of thin right. air. Or when you're grocery shopping, like if there's two brands, I often will say, you know, well, this one's cheaper. It's this much cheaper and it's really the same thing. So we're going to get this brand. 
Oh, but that doesn't work on everything. No, no, no. Cheez-Its must be name brand Cheez-Its. Yeah, and then you can say, <laughs> you know, the, these are two brands. This one's more expensive, but to me, it's worth it. Yeah, exactly. So I think there's just ways to teach them without necessarily um, having a special program or anything. But who does the budget and pays the bills in each household? You know, I'm very ashamed, but at the same time, I'm not because my mom did not budget. She did the bookkeeping at home, mm -hmm. and so I thought maybe I would have to do that. But Josh's dad did the bookkeeping, so he is the one that does the bookkeeping in our home. But I said bookkeeping, not budgeting. My mom always said you save as much as possible, and you just know where your money's at. You don't need to budget, and so that's kind of what we do. We've never had a specific time of where we budget every dollar. I will sometimes set up, okay, this you know grocery budget is getting out of hand, you know, the, the bill. And I will set myself a challenge of we're only spending this amount or something like that. So I've done like short term budgets or like no spend on clothes. But yeah, I don't do the traditional budgeting thing. My brother and sister, my brother and sister-in-law, they do like the envelope system and they love it. Um, and it's a great way, especially if you're getting married and starting out to just learn where money's going because money yeah. goes places you never realize. Yeah, we don't budget either. I, f I think it's a good idea. We just don't and we never did and I feel like it would be very much tension between us because of our personalities I would want to you know keep it really strict and if money runs out in one category what are you gonna do you're just gonna take it from another so we were taught pretty well how to manage money so it's not it hasn't been necessary maybe someday we will change our minds and have a budget but we haven't so far and they say that the biggest arguments out there are over money usually and for our relationship that's not you that's not really it we kind of trust each other we both know we work hard for our money and so our money is by the way together yeah uh, which we can touch on this because both of us make our, some of our own money and like yes you have your paypal account and everything right but at the same time if he wants it, he's going to get it. I mean, <laughs> we're all together. Yeah, exactly. I do all the paying Thanks. the bills, managing the accounts. Um, Eric really has no idea how much money we have. That's interesting. Though he I'm, checks every now and then, but I'm the one who does all that. Like, I pay the taxes and whatnot. I would say Josh is, like, the bigger spender, but he also sees the taxes and all the, like, scary numbers and stuff. Yeah. So it kind of keeps him in check. So how does that work with Eric? It he's is, not seeing the money. In the, you were saying money is not something you argue about. We don't currently, I just feel like things are not as tight as it used to be. But when it was tight, that is one thing that we did argue about a lot. Um, when we first got married, we had a rule that if you were going to spend more than $100, we needed to talk about it first. That rule has kind of went by the wayside. Um, At least on one end. But, <laughs> but that was one way that we kind of kept each other in check. It's not as much of a fight as it was when we first got married and we're so poor. Does your husband let you buy a thing? A thing? I don't know. I, <laughs> I buy whatever I want. I was going to say, we, our husband's married, like, Josh wouldn't have married me if he didn't think I had a good head on, yeah. on my shoulders. I know there's some situations where, like, for example, our grandparents, where, you know, grandma was handed cash and said, this is your cash for the week, and if that ran out, she didn't get more. Um, and that's why she started like selling things. And yeah, so she had her own money on the side. Like we don't. Yeah. If that I happens, much just spend at my discretion. If that happens nowadays, it's not like people tell each other about that. You yeah, know, that's a private in in the home in the marriage thing. Oh, credit cards. Yes, Mennonites use credit cards. We're Mennonites. We're gonna take advantage of that cashback system. Yes, we are. Absolutely. Um, however, we are encouraged, and most of us, I, I mean, I'm sure there's exceptions. I'm sure there's some Mennonites that are deep in credit card debt, but I don't know anyone that is. That would be horrible. Yeah, do you guys know what the interest rate is on a credit card? It's we have insane. never. Not, well, like, we pay in full every month. Like, we never carry a balance. If we would start oh, yeah. not being able to pay it, then I'd probably have to cut our credit cards up. Well, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, we believe in debt when it comes to, like, mortgages, but a mortgage rate is way lower than, like, yes. credit card debt. Right. Not, we and use credit also... cards to our advantage. We're going to look for the ones with the best cash back. We don't even look at the interest rate because we're never going to carry a balance. Yeah. We're just looking at the points. We could care less because, yeah. yeah, otherwise, no credit card anymore. But, but, yeah, and also, I guess, with that, business debt would be a thing because, I mean, I mean, I guess you would know more about that. Your husband just bought a business. Yes. So. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of debt um, on the business side of things, but... I don't know, the business kind of pays its own bills, so I don't view that... As personal debt. Yeah, I don't... Yeah, yeah and definitely a mortgage. Yeah, I mean, most Mennonites would have a mortgage. Yeah, I know, and some of you are blown out of the water that, like, Mennonites get married and buy a house. Like, we started out with this little rancher. You guys bought a house, too, right? Yeah, we did. Um, and that's pretty normal. Right now, I feel, I'm feeling for people, um, there's not a lot of houses out there to be bought <laughs> right at the moment. 
But yeah, again, I think that kind of stems back to working from a young age and not having that college overhead. Um, someone asked about 401ks or investing in retirement. I would say it's not something we put a huge emphasis on, but if you work for a company that's going to offer to like match a certain percentage, yeah, we're for sure doing that because that's free money. Yeah. And we have a, you have a lot of self-employed um, Mennonites out there with small businesses, you know, their son's working with them or whatever. So that plays a part. So they're probably not necessarily having a retirement fund. Um, or they're putting it aside themselves and not getting it matched. Same right. goes with like health insurance. Then you're kind of self-pay. But again, the church often will share in some churches. Some, some Mennonite churches are much more good with this than others. But like often if you have like a big unexpected surgery or something, you know, you'll have a benevolence fund that may chip in or something right. like that. It seems like a lot of Mennonites are in business and good business niches too. Is it encouraged to have a business? I would guess it's not. Um, I think it Mennonites, to have your own business. Mennonites like their independence. Yeah. Yeah. They like to be their own boss. Yeah. Are we not team players? I don't know. I guess there is a lot more opportunities too, wouldn't you say? In Lancaster County, you can really start from nothing yeah. and work your way up because, um, and there's a if lot you're of, willing to work, if you're willing to work and sweat, I can just, I would love to hear Josh's perspective on this. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of family businesses too, where sons will take over the business that their father started or. Yeah. I mean, Josh started his from scratch. He, um, we took our savings and bought a trailer and a truck of tools and, you know, paid it off. <laughs> Eric actually struggles with that as a business owner because he wants to hire the hardworking, energetic, go-getter guys. But then they tend to leave and start their own thing. A good employee who's going to work for the company and put their all into it and treat the business as if it was its their own is so valuable. I mean, they, Mennonites can't have, or anyone, can't have these big successful businesses without people that are employees. So I don't think we need to say, or I don't think anyone should be saying that a business owner is, you know, the best. Exactly. Because oh, without yeah. their employees, they're nothing. And some would argue, we've talked about this so many times with people from church, if you're married to a business owner, sometimes you're just, he's never away from work. He's always on. You know, it's you're on so vacation, much stress. there's always phone calls, there's yep. always stress hanging over your head. And so some people would argue you actually have more freedom as, you know, an Putting employee. Your, your eight hours climb up to the top and then have the boss take care of the, the yeah. you know, the top part. As a wife, do you need or have to have a way to generate income for your family? You know, Josh had a great perspective on this. What was I paying for? I forget. Well, I had my cousin come over sometimes and like clean my house for me and watch the children and stuff. And he's like, you know, you have a lot more overhead than like some women. Like they would just do it all. They would do their gardening, their cleaning, mm -hmm. their, you know, grocery shop, everything. Um, whereas you have to kind of pick your poison. So if you want to have a business, maybe that means you have to Instacart your groceries or you have to, you know, so I don't feel like it's looked down upon to be just a mom, you're, no. your overhead's way less. You're spending less. Right. You know. Right. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> My yeah. mind is just blanking. Yeah, but no, there's honest. no requirement that a woman has to make money on the side. But a lot do. I mean, even if it's just babysitting. Well, um, the Proverbs 31 woman is industrious. And I feel yes. like you're going to be industrious. Maybe it's not lucrative. Maybe it's not making money. Maybe it's saving but money. But it's, maybe it's profitable or saving money. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Or maybe it's service. Like, maybe you're a pastor's wife and you just pour your life into Or I'll plug Jane a little people. bit here. She pays her way for her kids to go to a Christian school. And then she also volunteers and takes uh, well, so far home. That and, happen. like, yeah. you also enjoy it, I guess, too. I, yeah, but, I do. Yeah, that's service. Yeah. Yeah, like my one friend is a pastor's wife, and I just feel like she is always doing something for the church. And I, but she, yeah, actually, she does have a job on the side too. I don't know how she does it all, but yeah. This is also the friend that makes the like the fifteen course Thanksgiving dinner. Yes, <laughs> we need to have her on here. <laughs> I, should, I would love to interview her. I did want to say we talk about women staying at home and stuff, and and I think in some Mennonite meccas and some areas, when you get married, you stay at home. That's like odd around here. When you get married, you go work. Like right. you go be that secretary or that school teacher yeah. or, you know, work at a store, do retail, whatever. You're not sitting at home and being a stay-at-home wife. No. Stay-at-home mom, yes, for sure. And But a lot, I would say, like if I'm speaking in generalizations, a lot of people will um, work, you know, even some part-time hours after they have their first kid because they have a supportive grandma that lives right down the right. road that would love to have her hands on her little grandma. Okay, so I have a question now. Because yes, we don't, we're not stay at home wives, 
So what, what do you do when your kids are all in school? Like I'm facing that next year part time. Like, am I supposed to get a job then? Like, what am I gonna do all day? Mm, well, yeah. so I'm kind of having like an identity crisis because oh, I can't. Jane, I believe I it. can't sew all day. I mean, yes, I could pour myself into that, but physically, like, I don't want to be sitting at a sewing machine all day. I'm gonna need something else. Or do I get a job? Do I go work at Eric's shop? Hmm. Comment down below if you have any suggestions for Jaina. I can't identify. I have three at home some days and two at home. Yeah, I mean, like all my life, all I wanted to do was being a stay-at-home mom, right? So now it kind of feels like, is that chapter of my life closing because my kids are at school the better part of the day? Yeah, and you'll have to decide too. Do you want it to be something that fulfills you or something that makes you money? Or like, you know, you're going to have to... Yeah, do I start fostering? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, in some ways it's like huge. Like the doors are wide open. Like I could do anything. In other ways it's like really overwhelming and I just want to have little babies at home and go on play dates. Aww. But you know, that's... that's uh, you can plan, happens. but God can change his plans too. So right. you never know. Yes, yeah. So we're sitting here very blessed, very privileged. We're like almost 30 years old now. I am. Gina is 30. Um, 31. 31. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to do an episode on that. Tw uh, 30 things we learned. No, 20 things we learned in yeah. our 20s. That, that should be interesting. Be a good one. But somebody asked, what did they ask? Have we ever felt like... Like you live paycheck to paycheck. Yes, I did. When we first got married and we even had two paychecks. And I still felt like we were barely making it and I did not know how it was going to work when I lost my income to stay home. So Because of having a baby. Yeah, right. Having a baby. Just staying home when I had a baby. But it worked out. I don't know how. It's easy to look and to compare and I don't know. I think, I think handling our money wisely is very important. It can buy you less stress mm -hmm. sometimes, but it can also get, get you more stress. You know, the more, more, more money, more problems, right? <laughs> That's very um, true. Yeah. I've, I've had times in my life where I felt dirt poor and times in my life where I felt so blessed and almost guiltily so, you know, maybe not in, in just money, but in just like all situations. And anyway, I feel like what is our takeaway going to be from this episode? If you listen to the last one, we talked about how we want our episodes to challenge you to go do something differently this week. Um, you just listen to, you know, hopefully you're doing your laundry and washing the dishes while you listen to us talk. I mean, maybe you're just looking at our gorgeous faces the whole time. I, I, I doubt that. Um, but yeah, what can you now go forth and do? Me and Eric kind of talk about this sometimes, how we think it would be so fun to like be really rich someday and just like give money away. Like go yeah. out, go Josh out, talks about that go out to eat and like just well, pay for that person's table or whatever, pay for their check. But the thing is, when are you going to get there? Like, we are already more well-off than a lot of the world, so I want to challenge myself to do something now. It doesn't have to be huge, but, you know, I could probably pay for the person's groceries in front of me if it was a smallish cart. You know, something like that, like, you always... Maybe talk... start with the coffee. Or a coffee. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's more feasible. But you always talk about, like, when you have money. No, you have money. You can, or I can bless someone in a small way. I don't have to wait until I'm at whatever amount of money I think I need. I don't know. But everyone has a little extra to share. And I think my takeaway from this is to model um, a giving spirit to my children and contentment to my children. Um, grumbling and complaining about things I don't have and things like that. It's not a good look. They are going to pick up on that. Even if they're only three, you know, they can see that kind of thing. Because you can't start too young. You really can't. Mm -hmm. Oh my. Well, I hope you enjoyed this one. Thanks so much for being here. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye, Bye. everyone. <laughs>